Before I begin this morning, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Lisa for trusting me to bring you the scripture lesson this morning. She is indeed a brave woman, letting a first-time homeless like myself bring the message. The reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9. Hear the word of the Lord. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into the fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, please guide my words, so that your message will glorify your Son, Jesus Christ in whose name I give thanks. Amen. So tomorrow we'll be ringing in a new year, and with each new year comes the hope for a fresh start. Out with the old and in with the new. We have many traditions with which we start a new year. New Year's Eve celebrations, a kiss at midnight, a toast, and of course, the ever-famous New Year's resolution. I was particularly curious about when and where the tradition of the New Year's resolution originated and which resolutions might be the most popular. So of course, being a 21st century gal, I went to the locus of all knowledge, Google. <laughs> I found several interesting tidbits of information about this practice. First. The New Year's resolution dates back over 3,000 years to ancient Babylonia, when the Babylonians vowed to repay their debts and to give back anything that they had borrowed. Second, the Romans began each new year by making promises to their god Janus, from whom the month of January is named. And third, in medieval times, Knights made something called a peacock vow to reaffirm their commitment to goodness and chivalry. So fast forward to today, and some of our resolutions don't sound very different. Get out of debt. Lose weight. Eat better. Spend time with family. Be kind. And if we wanted to add the most popular Christian resolutions, they would sound something like this. Read the Bible more often. Attend worship more often. Be like Christ more often. But if you listen to all these resolutions carefully, you will notice that they're all lacking in specifics. I mean, how often do you hear someone, particular someone who thinks just corn and peas are vegetables, how often do you hear them say, you know, I plan to eat broccoli three times a week? Or, I will always maintain my patience while driving and wave my hand only as a friendly greeting <laughs> rather than the uh, gesture of rage I might be feeling. You see, it's easier if we're a bit vague in our promises to ourselves because if we fail, and Google says that only 8% of us can keep our resolutions for three months, 92% failure. So if we fail, it's easier to shrug it off. I mean, I ate broccoli once. I was nice to that guy who cut me off, so technically I didn't fail fail. But for myself, I stopped making New Year's resolutions because I rarely succeeded. And, and I'm willing to admit this, after a week or two, I often could not remember 
what it was I had vowed to change. <laughs> so why is this change from December 31st to January 1st so significant? It's just one day. Yet culturally, we've attached importance to this transition from old to new. The idea that we get another chance to grow, to reaffirm, or to improve. Yet just one day can be important. The day we just celebrated, the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just this one day was the fulfillment of the Old Testament promise. Hear the words from the prophet Isaiah 9.6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. God was faithful on that day and every day, and it is on this faithfulness that we, like the church at Corinth, can rely Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, is calling them to live faithfully in the context of a city that made living faithfully before God difficult. Paul understood the challenges that the Corinthians faced every day. And later, in this same letter, he will chastise them for not remaining faithful to their spiritual gifts and to the new life that they have been given. I think it's helpful at this point to give a little bit of background information on Corinth and the context in which Paul writes this letter. You see, Corinth was a city strategically located on a bulge of land that jutted out into the Mediterranean, and as such, it served as a major port city. It was a thriving economic center and was inhabited by people from all over the Mediterranean world. And like many port cities throughout history, Corinth suffered from, I like to call them, moral challenges. They had a lot of money and a transient population. Not so different from today. Paul recognized that the Corinthians were suffering from divisions within the church. They were quarreling amongst themselves. They'd become very self-satisfied. And in doing this, they were denying their new life in Christ. Indeed, this letter addresses many of the issues that were troubling the church at Corinth, but at the beginning of what will become a very difficult letter, Paul wants to remind the Corinthian church all that God has done for them. First, God called them and they had been sanctified by God in Christ as saints. These words sanctified and saints, or holy ones, are related words in Greek, and they all, ref they all refer to the theme of holiness that is pervasive throughout the scriptures. To be holy is to be set apart from worldly things for a special or a divine purpose. So holiness, in this sense, it's practical, and it should shape the way the Corinthians live. Second, the Corinthians have been well equipped for the task. They have been given the grace of God, which is abundant in their spiritual gifts. And finally, God will strengthen them as they faithfully await the day, that one day when the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ will occur. We are not so different today. Just like our resolutions are similar to those in centuries past, our lives today and our calling in Christ are similar to that which the Corinthian church faced. We, like the Corinthians, have been equipped for faithful living. We, like the Corinthians, live in a culture that makes living faithfully a moral and intellectual challenge. We, like the Corinthians, are or should be committed to the life-shaping power of the gospel 
and our new lives in Christ. And we, just like the Corinthians, often find ourselves falling short. The scriptures tell us that God has already sanctified us. He has made us holy in Christ. So there is, in this sense, no work for us to do. And we know through the scriptures that God will give us everything we need in our life. We can depend upon the faithfulness of God. Paul states in 1 Thessalonians 5.24 that the one who calls us is faithful. And it is this faithfulness that marks us as holy. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3 says this, But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from evil. Second, we know we can depend on the presence of God in our lives. God told Joshua in Joshua 1.5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And third, we know we can depend on the Lord and his strength to see us through all circumstances. Hear the word from the prophet Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. But just like the Corinthians, in spite of these blessings of faithfulness, these actions of holiness, our actions, just like their actions, don't always reflect our sanctification or holiness. So when we think about this amazing gift of sanctification that makes us God's holy people, the question then becomes, do our words, do our thoughts, do our actions reflect this truth? And if you, like me, find yourselves at times lacking, then what should we do? I mean, should we really even bother with New Year's resolutions? Google says we are going to fail. But I would say yes. Look at the Apostle Paul and all of the trials and failures that he endured, yet he never gave up. And I would remind us that if we choose to make a resolution that reflects our faith in God, that God himself will help us keep this resolution, just like he helped the Corinthian church. So what resolutions should we make as we start this new year that reflects this new life in Christ, that shows that we are a holy people of God, that I am a holy woman of God, that you, CHPC, are the holy people of God? And how can we keep from becoming that 92%? I really thought about this for myself. If I was going to be so bold as to get up here and speak to you about words, thoughts, or actions that reflect to our community that we are God's holy people, what would I be willing to do every day that would make me stop and think about what I was doing or not doing about holiness? You see, I know intellectually I've been sanctified. And I can rationally think through my actions using a Christ-like lens. But unfortunately for me, I often find myself doing this after the fact. After I rudely waved to that guy who cut me off. Or when I was just too busy to be about the business of God's work. Because, I mean, I have a job, a family, I go to school. Shouldn't my work at seminary really count? But you see, that's not it. Holiness is not so much what I do, but rather how I do it and where my heart and mind are with respect to my actions. Remember what I said earlier? We are holy. The work is done. 
So after noodling on this for days, weeks actually, I realized that the answer was right in front of me. I don't have to try and remember to be holy. I just need to think about what that word holy represents. And probably because I'm a student and I'm constantly having to use mnemonic devices to remember the differences between Greek and Hebrew, two very different languages, I assure you, I began to think, could I apply that methodology to this word holy? How could I have holiness be at the top of my mind every day? How could I stay grounded in my daily thoughts about holiness? So, of course, I did what any good student would do. I created an acronym for the word that would be easy for me to remember. Holy. Honor God by starting our day with prayer. Holy. Obey God by offering our first fruits. Holy. Love God by loving our neighbor as ourself. Holy. Yield to God by opening ourselves up to the work of the Holy Spirit. Holy. It's just that simple. This acronym is not meant to be work per se or legalism because the Apostle Paul tells us that would just enslave us. No. Rather, it's our heartfelt desire to express God's inner work in us in ways that bless ourselves and bless others. CHPC, you are God's holy people today, tomorrow, and always. And even though New Year's is just one day, make it a day that makes a difference for yourself because in doing so, you may make a difference for others. You are holy. Be holy in your thoughts, your words, and your deeds because you are God's holy people. And may God himself give us the grace to be what he will have us be as we enter this new year. Amen.